Let's now hear from Al Haj Khalifa Uail Win, who will speak from the perspective of the Muslim community, but more broadly, share his views on behalf of civil society more generally. So, Eileen, the floor is now yours. Eminent religious scholars, my friends, let me greet you with an Islamic greeting. May peace, blessing, and mercy of Almighty be upon all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank David from Columbia University and also Professor William for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on my beloved country, Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar is a pluralistic, multiracial, multi-religious society. No religion originates from Myanmar, but Myanmar people welcome the other and they had the spirit of tolerance to a certain extent. So we could say that Myanmar is a true rainbow country where races and religion intermingle. During the time of Myanmar monarchs, we do have certain freedom of worship and they acknowledge us as a part and parcel of Myanmar. But after the independence, we were under the British for hundred years, then we gained independence by the united effort of all the races and all the member of the religion. We gained independence in 1948, a short-lived parliament democracy. And then in 1958, then the prime minister Uno handed the power to the military so that he can consolidate on his political uh, ground. So that made the military taste the blood. Then in 1962, there was a full-fledged military coup. So from then onwards, the totalitarian regime, they use the tactic of divide and rule. Uh, the, the, the usual old technique where the colonialists have uh, ruled the country. So what they did was politicizing religion. So they pick and choose Islam. Islam being a soft target, uh, easy prey, with Islamophobia rampant all over the world. So they projected Islam as a danger to Burmese Buddhist nationalism. From them onwards, systematic indoctrination and brainwashing has been going on in every strata of Myanmar society, especially among the majority Burma race, trying to uh, instill the notion that the religion and the race need to be protected. So recently, just before the, the onslaught of this uh, uh, military, uh, uh, what your dictatorship, there was some society known as Mabata, protecting the Bamaris and the Buddhist religion, who tried to instigate very simple-minded, pious, but uh, naive majority Burmese Buddhists in trying to say that Islamization will wipe away the Buddhism in the country, just like the Muslims had done to the neighboring country. So they started to, uh, what you call, uh, create these uh, distorted facts regarding history and then started to whip up anti-Muslim tension. So that this was backed up, of course, by the military dictators. So what happened recently? Due to time restraint, I have to cut short you know, and go to the round realities. The media is now portraying Myanmar as turmoil in the country. I would say it's more than a turmoil. It's chaos, absolute chaos. Well, David, I would like to respectfully disagree with you when you say that the youths were radicalized. They were not. They were forced to resort to armed struggle. They were protesting very peacefully. But peaceful protests were brutally crushed. They were killed. Not only protesters on the ground, but those who are inside the home. Let me, let me uh, uh, quote one incident, just one incident in Mendeley, when the father was sitting in the home 
and the soldiers came up to the room, inside the room. They crushed the door and they were about to shoot at the father when an eight-year-old daughter ran into the bosom of the father and the child was shot and dead, killed. So let me go back to the international community. Res responsible to protect. Well, I know about non-interference in the internet fail of sovereign countries, but it is a duty of the neighbors. If there is domestic violence in house, it is a duty of the neighbors to see that it stopped. This is where the civilized nation has the responsibility, but that responsibility didn't come up. So people have to defend themselves. What is happening at the moment? The, the formation of people's defense forces. What they are doing is they are defending themselves. They are not even on the road protesting, but they are shot and killed even inside their houses. So that is what is happening at the moment. For let me go back to the role of the religious leaders. We are all for peace and reconciliation. And majority of the Burmese people, no matter how they were brainwashed, they still have the spirit of tolerance. So all we need to do is to revive the spirit of tolerance. And now let me make some comparison between the coup that has happened in our country before and now. In 1962, there was a coup. They openly say that the military has to take over because the civilian politicians were corrupt to the core. So they have to fix things. So that is what they said. Then they formed a one-party system, socialist regime, and there was 1988 a uh, cry for democracy. Then there was another coup, another coup. They openly claimed that military has to do it where civilian cannot do. So then they have this 1990 election where the Democratic won landslide. They didn't acknowledge the election. And then only in 2008, they tried to draw up this constitution, the so-called democratic constitution drawn up by the military and ex-military people. So making sure that military maintain the upper hand. So according to that constitution, the military can take over the power from the president legally and lawfully. So what they are claiming now is that this is not a military coup. No, they said they are doing it constitutionally, legally, lawfully to defend what? Democracy, they said. The election has been rigged. They said there's a fraud in the election, which is not true at all because they are independent monitoring uh, organization that has assessed the election. Yes, there are flaws in the function of the election commission. It has happened to the other commissions also. Far worse than this, especially regarding the voters list. There are a lot of flaws, but nothing that would change the election results. Because the ground reality is that people are fed up with totalitarianism. They don't want any more dictatorship. They want democracy. This is, this is in the heart of the Myanmar people. They cherish that. And as a student, a very humble student of comparative religion, I believe that all the religions speak about justice and freedom and human dignity. These are the ideals of democracy. And Myanmar people, they are all for that. So they are got enough of this dictatorship. They have been under this repressive rule for such a long time. So this is what is happening at the moment. There is only two camp. One is for freedom, justice, peace, and democracy. The other is a camouflage, which have disguised in the name of democracy. Now they have even coined a new uh, term saying that the culture of honesty, they said NLD was dishonest. They have rigged the boat and they were cheating and they were trying to steal the power away. But the fact is that people wholeheartedly supported NLD. One factor is due to this lady. He has a personal charisma that can enchant the hearts and mind of the people. That is one point. Another point is that all of them are united against 
military dictatorship. There are flaws during the NLD term from 2015 to 2020. And these, uh, the military back uh, opposition known as USDP party, they thought that the NLD support will dwindle down. They don't expect a victory. What they are expecting is a coalition government. But as the election draw near, the resentment for dictatorship, especially for military, grew more and more. And USDP, the opposition, the main opposition party, started to feel the heat because they were under the shadow of military and they knew from their network that there's a very little chance that they will win. So even before the election, they started to you know, uh, give all these uh, excuses that the election won't be fair, that the commission is not free. And this rhetoric has been going on way before the election. So we have expected that. So what we have done is we requested, not only us, the Muslims, but also the, the, the Sangan, uh, Chief Sangha Council have also issued a request. The Christian uh, by the Myanmar Council of Churches have also issued requests for reconciliation, national unity, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So under the guise of um, protecting democracy, they staged a coup, but they said this was done legally and lawfully. Let me tell you one point. I'm not from the law background, but as a layman, I can say that according to the 2008 constitution, only the president can hand over the civilian rule to the chief of staff, the president. But the president and the, the, uh, the other leaders were put, in, put into detention early in the morning before the hunter convened and force the deputy president who was nominated by the military to take the position of president. And then they said, the president has hand over the rule to the chief of staff. And so according to the constitution, legally, they said, they are going to reshuffle the cabinet. They said, we are the same government. We are the same uh, uh, cabinet, but we have done a little reshuffling. So what they are saying is that we are protecting democracy. Now people on the ground are saying also we are for democracy. So there is a common ground, but there is a difference, a very deep difference, a difference of cheese and chalk. So we should know that the sincerity is lacking there. The honesty, the political will is lacking there. So what can the the religious leader do, and what can our friends from international community do? First, let there be justice done in Myanmar. Yesterday, we heard some good news regarding the release of 2,000 political prisoners. News are trickling in. We don't know as yet how many of the real activists will be released. And there was a news about some uh, the, the charges that were revoked against, most of them were celebrities, you will be surprised. Pop singers, artists, the film stars, they were charged with sedition and terrorist association with terrorist organization. And so some of them were absconding. So some of the uh, charges were revoked starting from a day before yesterday. Yesterday, it was officially announced that 2000 prisoners, political prisoners, will be released. So, well, it, this could be a step in the right direction. And as you know, the Security Council has entrusted the role of mediation to the ASEAN countries. Uh, well, to be very frank, we are not very much uh, uh, happy with the ASEAN group. Well, they are our neighbors. Uh, we can't choose, we can choose friends, but we can't choose neighbor. So we have to deal with them. So even in this, ASEAN group, they are some undemocratic uh, government which are backing up with the dictators. So even then the ASEAN has come up with the five roadmap solution to it. The Janta chief attended that meeting in Jakarta and he agreed, but once he come back, he started to change and he has started to twist and turn the interpretation 
of those five points a consensus that they have agreed. Nevertheless, ASEAN is now taking the role of the mediator, which the people on the ground do not trust at all. So our friends from international community who would like to uh, help us, you should try and build back the confidence and trust that the people in Myanmar is lacking towards ASEAN. ASEAN has to prove practically, pragmatically, that they are capable as the mediators. Th that means they have to be fair, non-partial, and justice. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. The first delegation that came to Myanmar met with the Janta chief only. But I don't know, behind the curtain, maybe they are discussing with the NUG, the National Unity Government, the parallel government that the opposition has, uh, what you call, form. We don't know about that. So let's go back to the role of the religious leaders. Uh, as a Muslim, Islam means peace, and we are all for peacemaking. But in order to attain peace, there must be justice and fairness. So the first thing we need to do is to prepare a ground so that there will be a suitable scenario so that we can sit on the table decently and do the negotiation. The dialogue should begin only where there is fair and free uh, circumstances around. If the leaders are in the jail, who will talk to who? Dialogue means uh, the talk between the two op opposing sides. If one side is mouths were shut and if their hands are tied, how can we do this dialogue? So it is up to the uh, international community to try and persuade them. Yes, there is a method of carrot and stick, stick, carrot and stick. ASEAN is holding the carrot. I think the Western world is holding the stick. And I think they should do that. Because uh, as a school teacher, uh, as an educator, what I have realized is that bullies are coward. Bullies are coward. If they know that they are watched, and if they know that there will be no impunity, then they will behave themselves. So the cases in ICG and ICC are also uh, hanging over the Myanmar political arena. So allow me to mention about the Rohingyas also. The NUG government has acknowledged the existence of Rohingya as people living inside Myanmar. As I've mentioned, Myanmar is a multi-religious, multi uh, racial society, a pluralistic society. No religion originate and no race emerge in Myanmar as well, just like the trees that come out from the earth. They all migrate looking for cleaner water, pure, purer water and greener pastures, and they all settle down inside the territory known as Myanmar. This is a federal state from the very beginning. That is what the ethnic races are doing. So they began to realize the, the reality of the existence of Rohingyas. But let me tell you, there are Muslims who are non-Rohingyas like me living inside Myanmar. We have integrated, we had assimilated with Myanmar society, and we are proud to say that we are Myanmar Muslim. We follow the faith of Islam, but we follow the culture and tradition of Myanmar. We follow the faith of Islam. So these Myanmar Muslims were also recognized by national unity government. For the first time in the history of Myanmar, NUG, um, I think it was uh, the, the prime minister who sent a letter of uh, what you call a greeting to the Muslim when we began our holy month of Ramzan. When we uh, mark the end of Ramzan and celebrate the Eid celebration, the president, the vice president of NUG, he sent a letter of uh, congratulation to the Muslim. So this is what is happening on the ground. So what I mean to say is unlike the, uh, the, the, the events that happened before this, there is unprecedented unity among the ethnic races among all the religious uh, uh, religions that exist inside Myanmar. 
So the opposition is very, very strong, very, very strong. But there is a common ground. We are talking about democracy. The other side is also talking about democracy. So let us grab from that common ground and start the negotiation. But there are things that need to be done before we go to the negotiation table. That is release, unconditional release of all the pro political prisoners starting from the president, Uwe Mie, state councillor Do Aung San Suu Kyi, and all the other political prisoners who are not from NLD also. A lot of ethnic uh, race leaders were also arrested. They must be released and there must be no, uh, what you called uh, intimidation. There must be no threat. There must be no oppression. And only then people can sit down and start, start to talk decently. And we need non-partial, fair-minded uh, mediators who can warn the trust and uh, confidence of both the party. So I think I may be able to uh, elaborate some more on the points that I've touched during the question and answer session. I think I should end with this note. And if there is any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much.